Hello, everybody, and welcome to our event this afternoon. So we're going to be talking about Ecoax 2020 Sustainability Reporting Performance Reports today. And we've got a fantastic lineup of speakers. We're going to be starting with Sherald Maradan, who is the uh, CEO and co-founder of Ecoact. Um, then we'll move on to Christina Raventos, who is the director of Ecoact Spain, and she's going to run us through the, the global findings across all four of the reports that we've issued today. We'll then move on to our panel discussion, which will be moderated by Stuart Lemon, CEO of Ecoact North Europe, and we are joined by um, this year's top four global leaders, um, Michelle Lancaster from Microsoft, Gabrielle Ginner from BT, Raul Alfaro from Acciona, and Thomas Lingard from Unilever. We'll try to pose as many questions as possible to the panel, so do add them to the chat box that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and if your company that's listed on any of the indices we've scored in the reports, please do get in touch with Ecoact for more information about that. Details will be at the end of the presentation. I will now pass over to Gerald. Hello, hello everybody. So uh, maybe you can move to the next uh, slide, uh, Joe. Yeah, I will do the introduction and the next, uh, next slide. Okay, so, uh, so thank you. So, you know, the, our report is, uh, is focusing on the sustainability performance for uh, four global share indices. Uh, this is the 10th uh, year for the FTSE 100 uh, research. And uh, we have incorporated uh, the other indices, I mean, in the following years, uh, the IBEX uh, 35 in 2016, and then the CAC 40, and then the DO 30. So the, we analyzed this year about uh, 200 uh, companies, uh, which is uh, great. Uh, and this year, I mean, across indices, we see that uh, companies that are continuing to adapt and to develop their uh, answers to uh, climate change. Uh, and they are aligning more and more with the best practices. Uh, so we, each year we try to strengthen the, 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 the scoring and the, the questions, so it's more difficult to have a, a better grade. grade. Uh, we see, uh, nevertheless, that most of the companies that have improved their scores, which is a, a good news. Uh, we, uh, so we didn't see a, a COVID impact this year, uh, uh, I mean, it's not uh, noticeable, but probably next year we will see what will be the, the impact of, uh, of COVID uh, in the next uh, research. So if we move to next slide, please. Okay. So uh, what are the main lessons of uh, the main findings of the 2020 uh, research globally? We can see that we have two main trends. Uh, the first one is carbon neutrality and net zero. Uh, we know that uh, over the last couple of years, we, we have seen a, a, a strong increase, I mean, in the number of companies committing to uh, carbon neutrality on net zero. Uh, they are having much more clear strategy on this. Uh, so it's really uh, noticeable uh, and it's great. Uh, I mean, we know that we have more and more countries uh, putting in the law the, uh, the carbon neutrality, but also you have a lot of local authorities and countries uh, declaring a uh, climate urgency uh, and saying that we need to uh, to be aligned with the Paris Agreement and with the net zero uh, goals. So probably this is a, a correlation with the, uh, I mean, the, the, the companies doing more and more uh, uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, and also carbon neutrality is really now uh, a, a way to structure your climate strategy uh, because globally, when you want to be carbon neutral, you need to align with the trajectory you need to offset your emissions, you need to uh, be more renewables, you need to know much more your uh, uh, carbon footprinting. So in fact, carbon neutrality uh, is really covering all what you need to do a good uh, uh, climate strategy. The, another main trend is uh, regarding uh, climate risk. Uh, I mean, a few years ago, uh, we didn't have a lot of companies uh, analyzing the climate risk. But now we can see that uh, with the TCFD and also, I mean, this is also required by investors uh, asking CEOs what is the, 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 the impacts of the, of the risk of climate and what is the opportunities. 
we have more and more uh, companies working on this uh, on this topic if we move to the next So, uh, as you know, the, we, we, we keep the same, uh, the same methodology, even we, if we strengthen uh, the, the different questions. So, we have about uh, 20, uh, 64 uh, questions, uh, and you have uh, different points for each of the, of the questions. And we um, based the research on the publicly available documents. Uh, the goal is really to ensure that we are awarding companies who are transparent, uh, in their uh, recent sustainability performance. So we analyze uh, the sustainability reports. We analyze the microblog and uh, the website. And I mean, everything uh, quite uh, easy, easily accessible by, uh, by everyone. Uh, we still cover uh, four main uh, sections of scoring, uh, strategy and governance, uh, targets and uh, reduction, engagement and innovation, uh, I mean, this is the way you will contribute to climate change in the future through your products and uh, your strategy, and also a measurement of reporting. So, uh, I mean, this is the main, uh, the, the main findings. I will just give the floor to, uh, to Christina to, uh, uh, to go deeper in the, in the research. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Rachel, and good afternoon, everybody. I will be guiding you through some of the main findings of our research this year across the four indices, and we'll be presenting some of the main global trends identified that are going to be shaping climate reporting in the following months and years. So if we move, uh, Joe, please, yeah. Uh, as you all mentioned, uh, despite more stringent criteria, scoring cri criteria this year, the average score from all indices has risen slightly from 53% to 55%. And if we look closely at the change in the average score per index, we see that the CAC 40 obtains the highest average score at 62%, followed closely by the IVEX with an average score of 60%, an increase from 56% last year. And then we see the Dow that ob obtains an average score of 55%, which is a one percent increase from from last year and hosts the highest scoring company at 94 percent and then finally we have we have the FTSE trades behind the other indices with a score of 50 percent and has also seen a one percent increase from previous year we've seen that also in each index there's a high range of scores between the minimum score and the highest score as you can see on on the graph and the FTSE is the one that it's hosting this the largest range of scores going from zero to 92 percent, which partially explains the, the lower average score, but this is not surprising given the, the size and the diversity of this particular index. So if we move forward to the next slide, we are proud to present you our global sustainability leadership table for 2020. Um, climate leaders are demonstrating a high level of performance irrespectively of their geography and also are demonstrated that, that action on climate change adds corporate value uh, as well. So now we are going to zoom in very briefly into the top three and we find that Microsoft takes the top spot on both the Dow and the global rankings. Uh, Microsoft continues to reinforce their commitment to tackling climate change and to innovate in terms of sustainable development. They are exhibiting a high level of transparency in the reporting, outlining as well a very detailed uh, climate strategy to reach net zero. And it's one of the only three companies in the Dow 30 that defines clearly what net zero means and differentiates it from carbon neutrality. Um, they also have uh, a carbon reduction target, including scope three, and has developed the only carbon neutral product listed in the Dow 30, that is the Xbox. In second position, we have Unilever. This is Unilever's second year in the top three of the global rankings. They also top the FTSE 100 ranking for the second year in a row, so that's, that's great. And they set ambitious and exemplary climate targets with a plan to have no emissions from their own operations and net zero emissions from their products by 2039. They are looking into um, procuring and renewable energy and going into 100% renewable by 2030. And then finally, Acciona uh, takes the third uh, position, the third place globally and the first place in the EVEX 35. And they are carbon neutral since 2016 and they have made outstanding pro progress in decarbonizing their business model. They have also committed to a science-based target aligned with a 1.5 scenario. And perhaps the most remarkable best practice they are aligning their economic activities to the EU taxonomy 
and currently 93% of their investment can be categorized as low carbon activities. So as you can notice on the top 20, indices, different sectors, and this shows that although we have very different climate legislation across the, the, these countries, it does not matter when it comes to becoming a sustainability leader. So now, after looking into, into the global ranking, we are going to run you through in detail some of the key trends identified from the research and that uh, Gerald has advanced on. So if we move to the next slide, please. Yes. Uh, the first trend, very important trend that, that Gerald also mentioned, is the fact that net zero and carbon neutrality is gaining momentum as a global response to climate change. We see Spain, the UK and France committing to net zero by 2050, and therefore it's not surprising to see that companies are setting this as their internal goals. We have seen a rise from 20% to 45% in the number of companies that are committing to net zero or carbon neutrality. And the EVEX 35 is the index that is paving the way, with 60% of the companies setting net zero targets. FTSE is also performing very well with 45% of companies committing and this is interesting as well due to the size of, of, this, uh, of this particular index. The Dow is the one that it uh, brings up the rear with only 30% of companies committing. Not surprising given the fact that the US has not set yet a country-wide target in that sense. This was also the first year uh, that we started identifying if companies clearly define what net zero meant to their businesses. And we have seen that um, out of the companies committing to net zero, 59% uh, define exactly what this commitment meant to their business. If we look at it a little bit more in detail, then we see that um, half of the companies committing to net zero or to carbon neutrality are setting out a robust and clear strategy to reaching this goal. And I think this is a very important finding. And the index breakdown shows that the CAC is the one that exhibits a greatest proportion of companies outlining a net zero strategy with 59% of those who actually committed. Um, net zero, um, as you know, requires a rapid decarbonization, and this should be in line with limiting global warming to 1.5. That is why uh, across our, our research and, and our report, we are focusing on the need to be setting science-based targets, which is the second trend that we are showing you now in a second. Joe, can you please move forward? Yes. Uh, thank you. So although carbon reduction targets seem to be a common practice now, across our global research we see that still 29% of the companies do not have a carbon reduction target, which means that we still have a lot of room for improvement. And if we focus specifically on science-based targets, we see that 38% of the companies are setting SDGs, which now represents a larger proportion than those companies that set standard carbon reduction targets. By index, we see that the CAC is the one that um, shows a, a better performance with 50% of the index setting science-based targets. And also in this sense, the graph also shows that the FTSE is lagging behind with only 26% of the company setting SVTs and an additional 70% committing to it. Furthermore, not all the SVTs are aligned with the most recent recommendation of the scientific community. As you may know, in 2019, the IPCC published a report highlighting the importance of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees or to well below 2 degrees. In this sense, the SVTI also responded to that and required that any new target that is being set uh, has to be done below with the, with the scenario of well below 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees. As a result, we are seeing, as you can see on the graph, that 51% of the companies that set a science-based target has done it uh, aligned to the 1.5 or to the well, to, well below two degree scenario. And this is an increase of 32% from last year. And then finally, and, and this is also quite an interesting insight, our analysis shows that setting SVT has clear advantages for managing carbon emissions. We have seen that 73% of the companies that set SVTs achieve reductions, and um, this suggests that actually setting an SVT outlines an achievable pathway to reducing emissions and keeps companies more engaged with actively reducing them. If we move forward to the next slide, you, we, we also present you another of the key trends that also Gerald uh, mentioned in his intervention. So um, climate risks and TCFD recommendations are also a key trend. It has been for quite a, a, a few years already. And this year we have seen another large increase in the number of companies aligning with TCFD recommendations, despite this increase in the strictness of our scoring criteria, in order to ensure that companies align with the four areas, key areas of the TCFD. 
we see from our research that 50% of the companies are aligning with the four areas compared to a 38% this year. And this is showing that TCFD alignment is not only increasing, but also the companies are becoming more explicit on how they are implementing these recommendations. And in terms of one of the key recommendations, which is the use of climate scenario analysis, we see that 56% of uh, these year's uh, companies are using it as a tool to, to understand better their risks and opportunities. And that this, actually this trend is very similar to the trend that we are seeing in terms of general alignment to TCFD. And then finally, the uh, last trend, uh, please Joe, if you can, yes. Thank you. Um, so the last trend that we are seeing is the focus on scope three reporting and the fact that uh, the focus on the full value chain is increasing. For the majority of the companies, we see that scope three makes up more than 40% of their overall emissions. So this is really an important element to address when tackling com company environmental impacts. What we can see from our research that 83% of the companies report part or the total of their scope three emissions. But if we look closely, then we see that only a few calculate the majority of the, of the emissions generated throughout their value chain. We see that although some of the company, uh, some, of the, some of the categories sorry, may not be relevant, um, it's, it's important to give a valid explanation as to why these are not relevant and therefore not calculated. So we see that only 18% either understand the full impact um, of the value chain or give a, a valid explanation as to why these categories may not be relevant. And more worryingly is the fact that only 38% of the companies uh, include uh, scope three under their carbon reduction targets, but we have seen that in general, uh, a lot of companies are showing reductions in that sense, but not specifically committing to an objective. These reductions may have been achieved through a, a greater interaction between stakeholders. So for example, we see that 92% of the companies engage with their suppliers in order to reduce emissions amongst many other initiatives. So just to conclude and give time to our panel, to, um, to show us good practices and, and explain a little bit more what they are doing. Um, we just wanted to, to mention that companies continue to adapt uh, and develop to the, the response to climate change as well as alignment with best, best practice. And over the 10 years that we have been undertaking this research, we have continued to see year on year improvements in climate related reported best practice. And although this year we are really encouraged to see an increase and an uplift in companies commitment to net zero, it's really important that these are backed up by sound and achievable strategies if we are to succeed in this global, uh, global war goal of net zero by 2050. That's it from my side. So I'm just going to uh, hand the floor to, to Stuart on the panel. Excellent. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, yeah, really, really interesting results this year. And I'd sort of echo what Christina says. Fascinating to see that uh, even though we've extended the uh, the scoring criteria to make, uh, you know, achieving a high score harder than in previous years, um, we are seeing scores on average go up. Uh, and I think that's evidence that corporate action in this area Um, welcome to the panel discussion. Um, I've seen a few uh, questions coming in to the Q&A box, which is great. Um, please do drop your questions uh, into there and we'll try to answer them um, when we've got through the, uh, through the panel discussion. Um, I'm delighted to have our four panelists uh, with us today, the representatives of the top four. I uh, really appreciate them joining and uh, I'm going to ask them in a minute to provide us with a, a couple of minutes each on what their programs look like, what uh, best, best pr practice looks like in uh, in their perspectives um, and then we're going to have a bit of a discussion around some of the key uh, trends that we've seen this year and some of the key questions that I think it might be interesting to share uh, with people uh, dialing into the call and before I do that um, just a quick sort of introduction to each of our uh, panelists um, so uh, firstly Michelle, Michelle Lancaster from Microsoft um, Director of Sustainability and Stakeholder Engagement, um, Corporate Responsibility and Comms Specialist, having led uh, Microsoft's Sustainability and CR Comms um, for about seven years, now leading the company's sustainability focus work with external stakeholders as well as uh, go-to-market strategy with customers and on product development as well. And a special thanks to Michelle for joining us because it's very, very early in the morning on the East Coast uh, and the West Coast of the, of the state. So thank you very much. Um, delighted also to have Gabrielle uh, with us uh, from uh, BT. Gabrielle's Head of Environmental Sustainability there, uh, having led 
the Environmental Sustainability Programme since 2009. Um, work spans all areas of uh, climate, um, focusing particularly on BT's one and a half degree science-based target, their net positive uh, carbon abatement target, which is uh, aims to help customers um, save three times the end-to-end -end carbon impacts of the BT business. Um, she also developed the uh, award-winning supplier engagement program, the, uh, the Better Future Supplier Forum. Uh, and outside of that, she uh, represents BT on a number of four, including WBCSD, uh, We Mean Business, Alders Great uh, Group, and also chairs the FN uh, UNFCCC Momentum for Change Advisory Panel. Um, so welcome, uh, Gabrielle. Raul Alfaro from Axiona um, joining us as well. Great to have uh, somebody from uh, from the IBEX uh, represented here today as well. Raul's got um, around 20 years of experience, uh, particularly focused in energy, environment and sustainable development. Um, his expertise spans all, all areas of that, energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, climate change, sustainable development, and also some, some broader expertise around uh, biodiversity, ecosystems and sustainable land management. So a, a, an interesting set of uh, experience to bring to this panel. Finally, we have Thomas Lingard from Unilever. Thomas is the Global Climate and Environment Director. Um, interesting that his experience both spans both uh, private and NGO sectors, um, having held leadership roles in both. Currently leads on uh, climate and environment within the Unilever Global Sustainability Team, responsible for strategy, policy advocacy and partnerships. Um, he led the development of the new climate and nature strategy, which uh, people on this call probably will be aware of and saw launched in June this year. Um, that includes a commitment to, uh, or a recommitment to, to one and a half degree science-based targets and set a new commitment um, around a net zero target by 2039 uh, and saw the launch of the, uh, the 1 billion uh, Euro climate and nature fund. So fantastic range of expertise and experience on a panel. Thank you very much to you all for joining. Um, there'll be, as I say, room, time at the end for questions, so please put those into the into the Q&A uh, box. And now um, I'm going to hand over to Michelle, if you could please take us through um, a little bit of what uh, Microsoft's up to. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Stuart. Um, and uh, I will go very quickly. I would just say as a Microsoft employee, it is my my duty, my obligation, and my privilege to make sure that we always have slides to talk through everything, but did want to give folks just a sense of, of what Microsoft was doing um, and really um, what we did this year that uh, raised our ambition and raised our score. And thank you for, for noticing um, folks at EcoAct. We're very proud to be here and to have the, the top spot this year. Um, Microsoft's work on sustainability is not new. We've been at this for more than a decade. Um, what is different over the course of the past year, I think, is less um, notable in terms of our goals and more important in terms of a strategy reconfiguration that led to the implementation of those goals. We had long thought about sustainability as um, something that we needed to do um, to look after and to improve inside our own four walls. So really making sure that we took accountability for our scope one and our scope two emissions from an operational perspective. Um, to that end, we have operated carbon neutral since 2012. Um, we have an internal carbon tax. Um, but as Christina noted, that IPCC report that came out indicated that we had far more work to do and far less time than we had previously thought, which meant that anyone that thought that they were in a leadership role really needed to take a hard look at their strategy in the past year and a half and step up their ambition and have a very clear roadmap to achieve it. Um, and that's what we did at the end of 2019 prior to the implementation and announcement of our goals. We sat down with our senior leadership team. And I think what is most notable about that work is that we went from sustainability as something we felt was a responsibility to sustainability as an opportunity and something that's deeply embedded in every part of our business. And if we hadn't done that work, I don't think you would have seen the level of ambition out of Microsoft this year. So you'll see that it's not just operations. We are explicitly including our products and services development strategy um, in this work, both how we develop those technologies and then how we deploy them to help others move more quickly to reach their goals. That's the customer and partner bucket. Um, we also realize that there's far too much for any of us to do on our own, even with Microsoft's global customer base. We need better floors. We need incentives for everyone to move more quickly. So we rededicated ourselves to really focusing on policy this year and for the next decade. 
Um, and finally, at the core of all of this is our employees. Um, this has become an issue that is incredibly important to recruiting and retention. It's a passion project for our employees and we're seeing more and more um, people step up. We started to see that with our internal carbon tax. Um, anytime you have a tax base that's asking you to raise the tax rate, you know you've got a captive audience. Um, and we decided to really unleash the power of our employees this year across those four uh, primary areas of sustainability for us, which are carbon, water, waste, and ecosystems. You can go to the next slide. Um, and so uh, I don't want to make uh, little of our goals, um, but I think the business transformation was really key to understanding how we were able to convince senior leadership to sign off on our full set of targets. Um, and we just announced water um, earlier this week at Climate Week, so we're happy to be done with um, all four of these. Um, we started in January with our carbon announcement. Um, I said we've been carbon neutral. Um, what we announced this year was that we will be uh, carbon negative, um, so we'll get below zero across all three scopes by 2030. Um, we also made the decision to take responsibility for our historical emissions, so we will remove all of the emissions from the atmosphere that we have pumped out um, since our inception in an in Albuquerque garage in 1975. Um, we'll do that by 2050. Um, and like Unilever and some of the other folks on the phone, we realized uh, again, that we really need everyone to lean in. Um, we need more innovation. We need more investment in that innovation. And so we established a billion dollar climate innovation fund that we have um, begun to already make our first three investments out of. From there, in April, we moved on to ecosystems. Um, we announced that we would build a planetary computer, um, at, which is just really understood as our commitment to collecting and housing all of the data that's necessary to understand um, what is happening on every facet of our world, how many forests do we have, how are they changing over time, um, so we can better understand human interventions in them, and then also to build the requisite compute power to make sure that we can run all of those data sets over time. We included some operational commitments there as well. Um, in August, we announced our waste target, which is to be a zero waste company by 2030, expanding on the work that we had already done in facilities and carrying that into our data center environment and through the use of uh, really looking at the end use of our products. Um, and then finally, as I said this week, water, um, uh, which would be water positive, um, which simply means that we will replenish more water than we used in water stressed areas of the world. Um, and so that is really at the top line of, of where we are. We, by 2030, Microsoft will be a carbon negative, water positive, zero waste company that is also building a planetary computer. So we'll be busy for the next decade, I think is, is really the summation of that work. Um, I do think it's important. Um, a lot of the times when we talk about net zero, we end up really focusing on carbon, but these are all highly interrelated. The energy water nexus is impacting the carbon emissions, the ability of uh, communities to adapt and adjust um, ties very deeply into ecosystems and water issues. And we really wanted to think about not just what net zero was inclusive of scopes one, two, and three, but really inclusive of what does the world need to look like in a net zero transformation needs businesses to fully commit. And we need to be looking at the full complement um, beyond carbon. And I think the last slide. Um, and I think this is the last piece. Um, those are all our goals, um, but we, need to make sure that that's translated into our product and customer strategy, as I mentioned, because for Microsoft to get there, it's um, helpful and necessary, but wholly insufficient to move the rest of the world. Our total um, tonnage in terms of carbon emissions is under 20 million metric tons a year, um, and that is you know, a drop in the bucket. Um, so what we've also really focused on is how to convert those high level strategies around getting to net zero, getting to carbon negative, and thinking about how we start to build that into our technology, making sure that uh, customers are benefiting from the investments that we make and that we're making that transparent and real to all of our customers. Um, we think that will help grow market demand for those services and provide a better return on investment, encouraging other businesses to lean in. 
Um, and then we'll move into developing new products and services, um, helping um, on a platform strategy and then on a tailored basis to help our customers move more quickly. Microsoft has the benefit of uh, working with nearly every government and every company in nearly every country in the world. And we intend to use that scale um, as well as our balance sheet um, and our focus on R&D that we pump about $10 billion into every year um, to really move the needle in terms of not only what companies can do, but what companies feel comfortable um, doing and making sure that that level of viability and possibility um, really all ties together. As we look at it, um, it we are at a place where um, ambition is necessary, action on that ambition is even more important, and then accountability and really having a clear roadmap that's being reported on across all of those is what we think um, is the best practice and really what we need to ensure that we're not only um, standing up at Climate Week and saying the right things, but going back to our boardrooms and actually doing the hard work to get there. So I'm happy to be here with so many other companies that are doing exactly that work, um, have been doing that work for a very long period of time. Um, and I, I quite frankly hope that there are a lot more new entrants on that top 10 list um, next year because uh, we need a lot more than just the top 100 companies continuing to raise ambition. It's really um, ambition, action, and accountability um, demands all of us that are on that leaderboard to do just as much work with our supply chain as we do with one another. Excellent. Thank you very much, Michelle. And there's a, there's a couple of things there that I think um, be interesting to pick up on when we get to the, the discussion. Um, if we can move the slides on, Joe, then I think we can hand over to uh, Gabrielle to talk, uh, talk to us about uh, BT. Gabrielle, all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so if we move to the next slide, please. Just wanted to talk a bit about our climate action journey that we've been on for over 28 years now. In 1992, we set our first carbon reduction target. In 2008, we set our first science-based target, uh, which of course before people were really talking about science-based targets, and that was to cut the carbon emissions intensity of our business by 80% by 2020. We met that target in 2016, four years ahead of schedule. Um, so then in 2017, we launched a one and a half degree 2030 science-based target, and we were one of the first companies in the world to, to set a one and a half degree aligned target. And in 2018, we pledged to be a net zero emissions business by 2045. If I think back uh, around the last 10 years and, and what has changed for us, it's really, we were initially so much focused just on our own operations. And what really changed is that we started looking across the value chain and we started working specifically uh, with, our, with our suppliers. Um, the reason why, if we go to the next slide, please. So if we look at BT's end-to-end -end carbon impact, uh, our supply chain is 69% of that and our own operations only 7%. Customer using our products and services, 24%. Uh, so we have a, a range of different targets and one that Stuart mentioned around helping our customers reduce their carbon emissions by at least three times the end-to-end -end carbon impact of our business. Um, so actually, what does that mean? So um, if, if we look at the three, uh, we'll look at the volume of sales of, for example, broadband lines or uh, various uh, telematics applications and their carbon reduction, how much carbon they help to save. And we add those up in the three. And then in the one, we have um, what's on the other side there. And um, actually, this is now worth uh, 5.5 billion of BT's total revenues. Um, so it, it's something that's become more than just talking about carbon savings and actually bringing revenue to the business. Um, and, and the reason why we, we spend a lot of time talking about targets and focusing on that is, is two reasons, really. One is um, for us, having these public targets has really helped to focus the business um, around meeting them. So at least for BT, if we go out in public and our CEO says, okay, we have these targets, you know, that galvanizes the business to start working uh, towards them. And we see that spurring um, innovation in lots of different areas. The second reason why uh, public targets are important to us is because of the demand signals that they send. 
So when we go out and we say, okay, we're going to uh, be a, a net zero emissions business by 2045, um, we will need the following things to get there. So if we go to the ne next slide, um, what we need to do is, is uh, around renewables, buildings, and fleet. And just by having an ambitious target, we hope to get other companies and, and governments to set equally ambitious targets, and that then will send a signal, for example, on, on renewables. So uh, we are currently at 92% worldwide. Uh, we need that to come to 100. Um, around our fleet, we have the second largest fleet in the UK with about 32,000 vehicles. And uh, we're working with the climate group and uh, 27, uh, 26 other companies, 27 in total. Uh, we're calling on the UK government to target 100% electric car and van sales by 2030, and also to, to look at speeding up the rollout of um, electric charge points across the country. So I, th I think it's important that companies come together and you know try to, to change the market by, by sending these signals, which is why targets are so important. Um, if we go to the final slide, um, and so Michelle mentioned as well, um, suppliers, incredibly important. We have around 14,000 suppliers, global spend of about 14 billion, um, which of course as a, as a customer um, gives us a sway over our suppliers. So when we focus on carbon reduction, uh, we uh, engage suppliers, asking them to report to, uh, to CDP. Uh, we found that just by asking companies to report to CDP or disclose, they actually start thinking about climate action, which is a good thing. Uh, we have a, a contract clause that we are working with our largest uh, suppliers on, which basically introduces a clause that means requires the supplier to reduce their carbon emissions over the term of the contract uh, with BT. We're also engaging with our suppliers, encouraging them to uh, purchase renewable energy and set net zero targets. Um, innovation, uh, sustainability innovation has been very important. We run something uh, we call a game changing challenge, which basically means that we invite key suppliers to come into BT and pitch new ideas. Um, and that could be anything from changing packaging to changing logistics to changing design of, of some of the products that they supply to us. And then we have a, a panel of BT judges um, that uh, declare a winner. And that's somebody that we then work with on there to take their idea forward. Um, just this week, um, some exciting um, news for us. So we've joined um, companies like um, IKEA, um, Talia Ericsson, and Unilever on an SME climate hub, which is basically going to be a, a hub, a, a, a digital platform, where we will be collecting uh, best practice and uh, strategies around how to, to set uh, net zero targets uh, in the hope that that will help more more SMEs to come on board on this journey. I think that was um, it for me. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Gabrielle. Um, yeah, some, some really interesting things. And again, stuff we'll, we'll come back to in the discussion. Um, Raul, I think we're going to hand over to you now. Give us a couple of minutes on uh, uh, the, the Axiana program and uh, what, uh, what makes that up and why that puts you into the top four of our uh, global research. Over to you. Thank you so much, Stuart. I um, hope you can hear me okay. Yeah, and indeed, perfect. excellent, thank you. And indeed, more than a presentation, I really wanted to get into a conversation on what all these targets, rankings, and, and ambitions mean. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to start with, um, you know, congratulating everybody who is uh, in those rankings for making it there. It happened to be first for us uh, in the IBEX in Spain. It could have been any different number. I think what is important is that we see in a long list of very ambitious progressive companies aiming for that. So I think that's something that I should congratulate to um, all the other companies uh, making the list. I think it's also remarkable to see the progress that's, that Spain has made. Uh, when you show the numbers of the IBEX, you did see that uh, Spain was the country that had the largest share of commitments. You have 21 out of the 35 companies making the index um, 
committing to carbon neutrality. I think that really shows the commitment that is happening in the context. So I think it really, it really goes beyond being first. It really goes being part of a large um, group of companies that are really committed to that. I think in terms of the uh, um, targets, I think uh, our focus right now really is on results. And the results are determined uh, on the one hand by you know, the targets that have been set uh, by the Paris Agreement, but I think we shouldn't be losing sight of the broader picture, which is the SDGs and the Vision 2030. And this is where we are ranking uh, our strategy. Um, for those who are not familiar with Acciona, um, Acciona is a company that uh, is sometimes seen as a energy company that has a legacy of construction business, or simply a company that was diversified out of uh, infrastructure into energy. We like to call ourselves a, a first company of a new sector, which is that of the SDGs. The SDGs for us represent a business opportunity. I think this is where we see the conversation moving because it really touches on the core of people's needs. Uh, when you look at um, the challenges of uh, access to energy or water provision, they really touch on people's lives. And this is where we want to focus our our strategy. We have a sustainability management plan for 2020 that we are updating to 2025 as we speak. Um, there you will have, if you visit our website, uh, a quite a specificity of some of our targets. Um, our SBT targets are 1.5. I think that's very important to uh, make the distinction. And I think the report from ECOACT really shows that. I think there is still a long way to go. I think I saw that half of the um, the targets, SBT targets are 2.0. Um, um, that's not good enough. We need to really get to 100% for 1.5. Uh, so that's some room for growth in there because it matters to, to, to all of us. Uh, but also, I think it's important to uh, look at the context where we come from. Um, Axiona was carbon neutral, cl climate neutral since 2016. Uh, that, that is basically the year that uh, the Paris Agreement was ratified. Uh, it was signed into in 2015, 2015 but it's on, it was only ratified the, the next year. For us, that marked the beginning of our carbon neutrality. Um, we've set up uh, science-based targets, as I mentioned, 1.5, 30%. Uh, uh, by 2030, 60% of our emissions, uh, it's one and two. Um, but I think what is really important, and it was mentioned at the beginning for us, is that we start uh, moving a little bit beyond targets and we move into results, uh, that we move a little bit beyond rankings and we move into really what moves the needle. Um, and maybe let me throw a number of figures in there. When you look at the um, um, 25, the, 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 the 25 biggest emitting companies um, in the world are actually uh, among the 15 leaders on the CDP rankings. So I think there's something that is not working right there. Uh, so we can give our give ourselves taps on the back on making to a ranking. But if uh, these companies remain uh, the biggest emitters, then there's something that isn't, isn't really working. In fact, six of them are top of the uh, uh, Dow Jones Sustainability Index. I think it really gives you a sense of uh, indeed the very the very encouragement uh, encouraging progress but also the challenges that we have ahead because if you don't move beyond the rankings then we we have a bit of a problem um, to 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 address and this is one of the reasons why um, for us um, um, taking into account the developments at the European level uh, the European Green Deal that we see as a Europe's growth strategy but most importantly very granular developments like the development of the sustainable sustainable finance taxonomy for us became a way of explaining ourselves better when you look at the taxonomy the taxonomy uh, it's identifying seven macro sectors that are uh, substantially contributing to uh, um, uh, greenhouse gas um, emissions. And so it is a really encouraging companies uh, that report according to this taxonomy to really reduce the footprint. Um, we decided, even though it was not compulsory to take on this exercise from last year, um, indeed, uh, in 2019, in the summer, we did a initial case study. Uh, this, is, this is available on our website. Um, and then we, in the end, decided to publish our financial accounts in accordance to the taxonomy. It is not compulsory as of yet. It will be compulsory in a year or so. But for us, it was very important to show how we stack up. Why is that important? Because um, many uh, panelists will uh, um, agree with me that there is a lot of confusion on ESG ratings. There's a lot of confusion on and challenges and concerns about greenwashing. Uh, how, however, we're now talking about a classification that has been approved at the uh, European Parliament level. Um, it has, um, if anybody has had a chance to look at the taxonomy document, it's about 600 pages. So it has very strict criteria 
to determine whether something is really green. And for us, that was a very high, uh, of high importance because uh, unfortunately now we're seeing with the very positive commitment that companies are making uh, uh, about sustainability, we also see a lot of uh, um, uh, question marks from the financial from the financial sector. Um, and so for us, it was very critical to uh, undertake this exercise such that in 2019, uh, uh, as mentioned before, 93% of our investments uh, were aligned with the taxonomy. I think this is a figure that says much more than any ranking for us. 83% um, of our operating results uh, were aligned with the taxonomy. And then 58% of our revenue were as well aligned with the taxonomy. Uh, for some of uh, yourselves that might be thinking this is just important in the context of Europe, it is not. It is really attracting a, a lot of attention. Uh, you may have seen uh, last week how Europe has uh, increased its commitments in terms of climate targets from 50 to 55% by 2030. But for us, it actually helps us explain something that is a bit difficult to explain. Um, I mentioned earlier that the taxonomy identifies these seven micro sectors. Um, Axiona business um, actually is aligned with six of these uh, micro sectors. What does that mean for us? Is that we cannot really see ourselves as simply a company that uh, just provides electricity or supplies water, but rather a company that is addressing uh, humanity's uh, pressing challenges as identified the vision 2030. And so that's how we want to look at these numbers. How close are we uh, to uh, contributing to impact rather than just simply reporting on performance? We really want to take the lead in addressing the world's pressing, pressing challenges. And I'm joined by a number of companies who have and share the same vision. But for us, uh, I think it goes beyond uh, presentations. It actually goes into showing results. Uh, all of those are available in our website. And I'm really looking forward to engaging in the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks very much, Raoul. Um, some interesting stuff there. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to probably a couple of those points if we, if we get time. Um, but first, we'll hand over to Thomas to uh, take us through uh, your view from, from Unilever, please. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you very much for the invitation to join you. Um, conscious I'm the, the fourth of four speakers, um, I will be as brief as I can. I've got just um, this slide and two others, and I'll try and just make three points. Um, forget the first slide. Um, we put out a number of new targets in June that supplemented some existing targets. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick in the uh, chat box a link to the detail of those commitments so that you can kind of read up in your own time the detail of them. Um, I thought maybe rather, rather than to, to chat through those, because I think that's really important when you get into the climate bubble it becomes very very sort of net zero climatey carbon centric um, we've got a point of view on secondly around the integration to business strategy and this being something wholly woven into uh, how the company thinks about the future uh, and, a, and a third point around how you structure sets of targets to drive particular behaviors which is something you know in, in putting this slightly strange set of targets together um, that we, we thought a lot about. So on that integrated point, I mean, every business is different. Every business uh, has a different kind of value chain, different kinds of issues. Um, Unilever has about two thirds of its raw materials coming from agriculture. You know, we're very steeped in the uh, debates going on around, uh, you know, the effects of agriculture on climate change, whether that's, um, you know, deforestation in commodities, supply chains, or, uh, you know, on the upside, the potential for sort of soil carbon, um, sequestration from new forms of regenerative agriculture and we really didn't want to come out with a climate strategy on its own it felt very um, a siloed approach for a business like ours so we, we we worked really hard to launch a climate and nature strategy um, back in June some of the headlines you sort of see here and um, you know we spent a lot of time yeah, you know, these things are owned in different parts of the business, and that's that's one of the challenges is getting getting cross divisional, cross functional working groups. But you get to a point where you you have spent enough time deciding that planting a tree, you know is planting a tree a climate action or a nature action. You know, it doesn't really matter. You just need to plant more trees. So we've we forced this together into a strategy. Uh, we think it's we think it's working, although it is a new way of thinking about it. Uh, and the targets help that sort of hang together. So a mixture of de hard decarbonisation targets, um, uh, investment in uh, natural climate solutions, um, tightening our codes for suppliers on uh, on how we want the agricultural raw materials grown, uh, and also water too. You know, water is you know both has an impact on climate and is a key part of the adaptation agenda. 
uh, we think you know we, we tend to have a mitigation conversation in the climate space and with you know good reason but the adaptation space is important too for a business with um, two billion consumers around the world and many of whom are in in quite vulnerable locations so um, yes yeah, so the importance of not just getting lost in the in the climate silo was my first point um, second point on on business strategy again as I said we're all different sorts of businesses different sorts of business models Unilever is, is a heavily brand centric business so many people around the world don't know who Unilever is but they'll know who Dove is they'll know who Magnum and Cornetto are um, uh, and and uh, it's very hard in Unilever to get very large um, strategic investments in projects which do not come back to support um, our brands in some way. And, um, you know, we've been, you know, like, um, like Michelle and uh, Gabrielle and Raoul, we've been in this space a long time, but it has been quite a corporate agenda for Unilever um, in terms of trying to do the right thing, trying to decarbonize, getting, you know, power to renewables. It's been less visible in our brands and our divisions historically. Uh, and often because consumers have been more interested in the social issues, you know, around uh, around products than they have in the environmental issues, bar some very niche, niche segments. Um, and we see that changing. Um, we expect that, you know, consumers are going to become even more demanding than they are today in terms of how, uh, you know, how they see brands and companies responding to this. Um, and what we're trying to do with the Climate and Nature Fund that's quite interesting is to use that money uh, sort of to, to give the purse strings, if you like, to our brands and our divisions to say, can you find uh, investments that you want to make that are relevant to your value chains and your supply chains um, that you can also then engage your consumers on and use that to drive consumer preference. So this is not just a sustainability strategy. This is now baked into the heart of our um, business strategy. And you'll see um, on one of the, the links that I shared, you know, the clean future announcement that we, we put out at the start of September which is really um, our home care business's attempt to try and um, integrate some of that thinking into how do you how do you take the spirit of of moving towards net zero um, in into the core product territory and make that relevant to consumers. And then the final point, just on on the structure of those those targets. If we go to just the the last slide, um, we already had um, these targets to be. Uh, zero emission in our operations, so basically switching all the energy sources to renewables and and uh, getting rid of the nasty uh, uh, high GWP refrigerants. Um, and we already had a target to halve the life cycle scope three footprints across the value chain of our products uh, on a per consumer use basis to allow for changes in the mix between our, uh, our portfolios. Um, and they're both 1.5 approved by SBTI. But you know, with all of the momentum around the the need for a long term signal, we went with the with the net zero by twenty thirty nine target too, um, and that was really again uh, you know partly a political act because we know the power um, in the policy and advocacy space of of big companies setting up and saying you know setting a direction of where they think the world should be going, um, but also to start to inform a point of view on on offsetting and the role that should play, and you know we were quite careful in this one. Um, to not have that target drive a rush to buying lots of cheap offsets. Um, we are putting, you know, we are intending to put the money in through the Climate and Nature Fund, but we didn't want a situation where the business felt it could take its foot off the pedal on accelerated decarbonisation by buying offsets. So we've kept that Climate and Nature Fund, which, you know, long term ties into that 2039 target, but in the short term, um, the business has has these very fixed decarbonisation targets, which it can only meet by by taking the carbon out of the supply chain. And you know, we 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 toyed a lot with different options of constructing different types of targets, and we just um, you know we found that was the best way to to drive the right behaviours. Because as soon as you give somebody a three euro a ton way out of doing a hard thing, they will take it. Um, uh, particularly if that target is going to be, you know, monetized, attached to performance rewards and bonuses and so on, as, as you know, we're pretty good at doing in Unilever. So, um, yeah, so we haven't given our team the easy way out to get to zero, um, but we are, you know, committing through that fund to drive the right um, behaviors in terms of investments in, in nature-based solutions. Excellent. Thank you. I always good not to give people the easy option. Uh, I think uh, so, well, I would welcome that and celebrate that. Um, thanks very much to the four of you for those uh, presentations and comments. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, we've got a few questions just for, for, for that I'd like to ask and, and have the chance to discuss. And if we've got time, we'll, we'll pick a couple of the questions that are, uh, 
um, attendees have, have put through the chat box. I, I guess the first question really for me and one, one that's really important is just to understand for each of you what the main drivers have been of your climate ambitions. Um, you, you're mostly um, you know, a long way down the sustainability and climate journey. You've got well-developed uh, programs in place, hence the results that you've seen. But I'd be interested to understand what the main drivers have been and particularly how that's changed over time and perhaps recently. You know, Michelle, you, you referenced the shift from kind of doing this as, a, as a, an act of responsibility to one as, uh, you know, of, of opportunity. Um, you know, Gabrielle, you talked about uh, being one of the earliest to adopt a one and a half degree target, a very high level of ambition at the time. So interesting to hear, um, yeah, about what, what's driven your businesses. Perhaps, Michelle, you could start. Yeah, um, I, I think it's it's really simple, and I, I want to be cognizant of time. Um, but I think it's uh, it, it was we're a data driven company, um, and there's a lot of data that indicates that you need to be doing a lot more. Um, that I think anybody in the sustainability space that um, feels good about where they are right now relative to the global data is um, probably not uh, paying a lot of attention to the world around them. Um, yeah. So. We feel a lot of pressure in terms of time. Um, we feel a lot of both pressure and opportunity from our shareholders. I mentioned our employees. Um, I think sort of the holy trinity of the market, um, your talent and your competitors are really pushing us um, forward. I think we see it's both the right thing to do and the thing that we need to do um, as a really large company that has a pretty significant footprint. Um, but I think it, it's really, I think uh, Rolo mentioned this is the the state of change right now in what constitutes leadership and what people expect large companies to do um, is changing rapidly and has really in the past um, two years. I think that's particularly true in the United States, given our current political um, reaction to climate change. Yeah, yeah. And does that um, perhaps lack of political engagement in climate change hold you back? Does it, you know, do you find that there are people within the organization who use that as an excuse to not do something? Uh, I don't think so. Our president and our CEO have been pretty clear on um, where we will agree and where we disagree. Um, and I think I remember talking to our president, Brad Smith, um, right before we announced um, our AI for Earth program. Um, and uh, he said verbatim to a reporter, uh, the US may be out, but Microsoft is still in. And we have a pretty large GDP and a pretty large um, reach and a pretty large revenue number. Um, and I think you see a lot of companies in the United States um, feeling more emboldened to step up because yep. um, I think that's been removed. Okay, great. Thank you. Gabrielle. Yeah, um, so just to add one thing, I agree with everything that, that Michelle has said, just to add to that as well, for us, it's been around the business case um, and cost savings. So we use about 1% of the UK's electricity for our networks and, and data centers. So anything that we do in terms of, of energy efficiency and, and driving down energy consumption uh, is good for the business. So in the past decade, uh, we've saved around 343 million pounds through energy efficiency programs. Yeah, yeah, that's a real, um, a very significant, very significant. Oh, and, and just one, one more point, I, I guess on, on a leadership, you talked about, you know, being leaders and, and leadership journey. I think it's, it's quite hard once you've started in a leadership type position to then say, okay, you know, you step back from that and, and you're not going to be in that position. So it's kind of self-perpetuating, you know, you want to stay where, where you've been and it's really hard to go backwards. And, and do you think the, the sort of change that we've talked about that's happened in the last two years, particularly with, you know, uh, implementation of TCFD, the um, publication of the one and a half degree report from the IPCC and all of the sort of momentum that that's driven net zero governmental targets. Um, do you think that that makes this and, I, and I'm sort of picking up a point you made on, on uh, Twitter earlier on, Thomas, you know, do you think that that makes this very much mainstream now and, and it's a sort of shock and surprise if corporations aren't doing it? Because, uh, you know, our, the, the results of our research show there are still quite a lot of organizations not, you know, engaging and stepping up and, and you know, taking taking this stuff as seriously as, you know, we all clearly agree that they need to do. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I think definitely. So, yeah, I've been in, in this role for about 11 years. You know, things have definitely moved on. Uh, 
you know, from, from me just kind of talking about uh, climate with people within the climate uh, bubble um, to being more widespread and, and people knowing it a lot more about it. But I, I, I think, Stuart, you're absolutely right. Um, we here who are interested in this, you know, to us, it, it, sometimes it seems, yes, everybody's doing this, but when you look at your statistics, actually they're not, right? Mm -hmm. So there's so much more that we need to do, and, and that's what I think for us, focusing on, on suppliers, focusing on, on SMEs where we can have some influence is how we're trying to, to drive to get so many more companies um, come with us on this journey. Yeah, T Thomas, I think you were going to sort of step in on, the, on that point. Yeah, look, um, if, if it was only a technical problem of decarbonisation that, that we were facing, I would say, you know, do you need a target? Maybe, maybe not. You know, it's possible you could be a business that's, you know, got the right values, got the right strategy, you're busy working away at it. You know, but we know this is a political change process too, and um, a huge societal transition that needs to take place with some quite tricky things that need to be solved by um, politicians primarily in the in the short term in terms of how that transition will play out and, you know, how you take care of the you know the people who lose out through no fault of their own through that transition um and i think the 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 difference between a good sort of decarbonization strategy and a good climate strategy is one that recognizes that you're fundamentally engaged as a political small p actor in a systems change process and the act of you know putting your target out there even if you're not totally sure how you're going to uh, meet it um, is incredibly helpful to politicians who would like to go further and faster, who've read the IPCC report too and are terrified by the prospects of what inaction would mean, mm. um, but need the air cover from businesses that say, we don't know how to do this yet either, but we can see we've got to get there. So why don't we all commit to it and then start, you know, stop the together. discussion on whether we're going to do it and start having the discussion on how we're going to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Um, I, which leads sort of interestingly on to the, the next question that I was going to ask around challenges and the challenges that um, you've encountered as, as businesses. Raul, like, you know, you, you had a very sort of interesting uh, thread to, to what you were telling us around the uh, EU taxonomy rules and whether, um, you know, that provides an opportunity or whether that's just an example of how you've responded to a challenge. It'd be interesting to, to hear a bit more about that. Thank you so much, Stuart. Maybe I'll start with your quickly with your previous question, which yeah, is our sure. driver. Our driver is the SDGs. Um, you know, the Sustainable Development Goals are our roadmap. Um, and it's as simple as that. Um, then we happen to uh, be a company that develops um, infrastructure for mitigation, adaptation, resilience. If you look at the SDGs, 72% of the SDGs depend on this particular investment on infrastructure. And I'll give you a couple of figures. Um, nine, 940 million people in the world lack electricity. Uh, that's just simply unacceptable. Uh, 663 million lack drinking water sources. That's just simply not a place to do business. Uh, 2.4 billion lack sanitation facilities. Um, and the list goes on. Um, I think uh, I'm joining this panel after 10 years working in multilaterals in the UN, in the World Bank, and also 10 years working in the private sector. I think that is, this is the time where business really needs to deliver on humanities biggest challenges. And I think that's really what drives us. Now, what happens, and moving to the point of the taxonomy steward, is that then it does happen that there is actually plenty of capital to address these challenges. Uh, but just let me give you a, a, sort of like the, the, the bill on, on these challenges. Um, um, there is an estimate that in order to address uh, the goals of the um, SDG number 13, we need an additional $660 billion annually. Okay? And then you're hearing trillions of dollars uh, in um, uh, recovery packages around that. So, so where is the disconnect? Then you have that, you know, to address some of the water and sanitation challenges that I've mentioned earlier, you just basically need to increase uh, the investment into $260 billion per year additional. Again, I'm comparing that to the trillions that I've mentioned earlier and the trillions that you keep hearing in the news these days when you talk about the COVID, post-COVID recovery. And then you need, uh, in order to address some of the uh, access and uh, connectivity challenges, you need to invest $400, $400 billion in roads, ports, rail. That's what we do. But I think it would be very, very simplistic to say, you know, we just build bridges. We want to address humanity's biggest challenges. However, I've mentioned the trillions. Um, in, there's money on the table, but at the same time, there's an investment gap, which is estimated at 2.5% uh, of GDP uh, globally. 
So the taxonomy for us helps us precisely to show investors where you should put your money, put that simple. Uh, our chairman yesterday mentioned it in the um, Climate Week New York that for us, the SDGs is a business opportunity. It's not all negative, it's not all gloom and doom. In fact, yeah. there is something to do. Um, but then capital needs to be moved to where the needs are. And so the taxonomy helps us show investors because investors are confused, I mentioned earlier. Uh, there is significant problems with greenwashing and we know them. Um, and so I think it's important that taking the leadership of the European Union, taking the leadership of many governments around the world, like New Zealand, like France, in terms of climate laws, uh, climate reporting, it is important that now we have the clear signals from public institutions on what is green and what is not green. What does help um, companies contribute to these uh, very ambitious targets of net, net zero? Well, we need to tell investors where the money uh, should go. And for us, indeed, the taxonomy saying 93% of our CAPEX is aligned with the taxonomy is an important signal to the markets because right now they don't really get it clear with the very alphabet soup of S S S S -G yeah. ES ESG rating and ranking. So I think that's where the taxonomy helps. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I'm quite conscious of time. Uh, we've run over a little bit already uh, and uh, participants are unfortunately dropping off as they have other commitments to go to. So I think we'll try to wrap it up there. Um, I would firstly just like to say thank you very much to all four of our participants. Really interesting presentations uh, and uh, really interesting responses to the questions uh, and also a final congratulations on the uh, excellent success of your respective companies in our index this year. Um, the uh, detail of the reports is available all through our website. Um, all of the links are shown there. It's all uh, all on the on the landing page, so you'll be able to find both the reports and the contact details for uh, EcoAct if you have questions. If you are one of the participant companies in one of those indices and you'd like some more detailed feedback, get in touch with us and let us know, and we can share that information uh, with you. Um, but apart from it, apart from that, um, that's the end of our session today. Thanks again to our panelists. Thanks everyone for joining and um, have a good rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye.